And the theme of it next week is Trinity. And it gives us a great opportunity for our confirmation class to interact with other confirmation classes all over the Presbyterian. So we ask for your prayers for travel and that it be very beneficial for them. So thank you. Mark. Real quick, I just want to thank everyone again that came out yesterday. We had a uh, good cleaning day, and uh, we had good fun, and um, we got a lot accomplished. And uh, David and Dennis uh, take the front uh, windows, so we've got to let take one and it matches our stained glass. It looks really nice, and uh, we got a lot of other things accomplished. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? I have another one, Beth. <laughs> Just okay. um, I know it's come to my attention that our uh, young people really love to devour the loaf after service. <laughs> I'm not stopping that. <laughs> do that. I'm just going to delay it for a moment. I want to take uh, a piece of this loaf with us for home communion this afternoon. Um, so I will. So if you go and take it, don't devour the whole thing. Just be sure to leave me a, a chunk behind. Because uh, I, I want to share that with our folks who can't join us this morning. Uh, but that was that one announcement. You might also want to note that um, for those of us who remember and um, knew Bob Steele, a long-term member of our church, his memorial is going to be next Sunday. So um, we hope everyone will be able to stay for that. If there are no more announcements, let us worship God. <coughs>
the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Trusting in the Spirit of God, let us confess our sins. O Lord, if you have our sins against us, who would have lived and who would have sang, we seem to have more faith in death than hope in your promise of life. We seek after false idols and find security in earthly wisdom. We abandon the hungry, sick, and dying, and pursue wealth in reckless abandon. And even so, you love us. Still, there is forgiveness with you. Therefore, we worship you, for you alone, O Lord, can save us from death and redeem us from our sins.
wait for you, and in your word we trust. By the power of your spirit, set our hearts and minds on the source of life and peace. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Um, reading to you today in the Old Testament, Genesis 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin." because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. lesson comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 23 to 35. Listen now to the good news of Christ. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servants as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock. Last week, we talked about the third step towards reconciliation, which is repentance. It is appropriate that repentance comes right in the middle of the five steps Marjorie J. Thompson elaborates on in her book, Forgiveness, a Lenten Study. Repentance, she argues, and I agree, is the principal act of the cross event. At the cross, we find the intersection of God's divine love and divine justice. Our sins, 
were nailed on the cross with Jesus. Our condemnation was played out on the cross with Jesus. And yet, this is the sad part, and yet we still turn and sin against God and our neighbors. Each of us is in constant need of saying we're sorry. Repentance, then, is a turning point. Remember metanoia, a change in mind and attitude. To get to repentance, we need to be able to examine ourselves and be honest with ourselves about the sins we commit against God and neighbor. We need to be able to say we're sorry, sorry, and be truly remorseful for our actions or inactions. But the repentance part is only half of the equation. Reconciliation is a bringing back into harmony, which means there are two parties who are at odds or in disagreement. One party seeks forgiveness while the other offers it. Forgiving is the topic at hand for this morning. Forgiveness is central to the gospel message. It is a, as a much a part of Christian theology as the Trinity or communion. Our other world religions, they have aspects of forgiveness woven into their theologies, but none other has it at the center of faith than Christianity. The cross event, which is so integral to who we are, is the purest example of forgiveness extended to the human race. Not only are Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection signs of forgiveness, but also our Lord himself frequently preached aren't forgiven. For instance, in Matthew 6, 12, at the heart of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus instructs us to pray and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. In Luke's recording of the Sermon on the Plain in 6, 37, Jesus says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And the parable we read this morning came about because Peter asked Jesus in Matthew 18, 22, if he should forgive someone seven times. Jesus responds, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. This is also translated as 70 times seven, which is a number yet more unimaginable for Peter. Paul even picks up on forgiveness and tells the Colossians in 3.13 to forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. If we were to take a list of the top five doctrines of Christianity, forgiveness would certainly be included, if not coming at the head of that list. You see, forgiveness isn't just a downward activity. It's not just God forgiving us. We are called to offer forgiveness as well. When we are wronged, we are not to take up arms against our offender, but extend forgiveness. That's hard to do, isn't it? Nowhere do we find a more extraordinary tale of forgiving our fellows than in the parable of the unrepentant servant read this morning. In this story, we see a king who wishes to settle accounts with his servants. God is the king in the story, and we are invited to place ourselves in the shoes of the unrepentant servant. Now, in order for us to fully understand the weight of this story, we'll need to understand the sums represented. The 10,000 talents of the first slave is roughly equivalent to 150,000 years of wages, while the 100 denarii of the other is equivalent to three and a half months of wages. If we use today's minimum wage, that's about $60 a day, which equals a grand debt of $3,285,000,000. That's huge. The servant whom the king forgave owed over $3.2 billion, while the other only owed him $6,000, a small sum comparatively. And yet the first servant is willing to throw the second into the debtor's prison. 
Jesus' point, says Thompson, is that we owe God vastly more than what anyone could conceivably owe us. Moreover, God has forgiven us that debt, as is suggested in the parable. And Jesus is uncomfortably frank about the punishment of not forgiving. By all scriptural accounts, forgiving is not optional. It is imperative. The human race, however, isn't always predisposed to do the godly thing. Our fallen selves can easily block our acting on the knowledge that forgiveness is imperative for followers of Christ. Thompson writes of two responses for not offering forgiveness. The first, I should, but I do not want to. And the second, I can't yet. We're going to unpack both of these. The first response comes about when we feel entitled to something that we've lost and don't want to forgive. In these situations, Thompson's, Thompson suggests, it can be a good exercise in self-examination to ask how much of what we feel is legitimate and how much makes a juicy, good story of victimhood to elicit sympathy from others. Let me use this story as an illustration. There was once a lady who worked in corporate America She'd worked with this organization for over 15 years. Well, like many Americans, after 2008, her organization went through some economic constraints and therefore had to cut several positions. Hers was one of them. After 15 loyal years, she was sacked. As you can imagine, the news came as quite a shock to her. She thought that her work was central and valuable to the organization, and that value would keep her on staff. Needless to say, she felt aggrieved and victimized. It seemed to her that all the hard work she put in was devalued. She felt at that moment the sting of realizing that she was far from indispensable to the organization. In her mind, these were blows to her ego. Her self-worth plummeted. Now, she could have easily wallowed in the seductions of feeling unjustly dismissed, knowing that many of her colleagues were also shocked and dismayed by what happened to her. At times, even their sympathy fueled her sense of entitlement and feeling of resentment. But this story has a happy ending. Thankfully, she was aware enough, and from early <coughs> on, she knew that those feelings were selfishly driven. That was the first step of self-examination. She was also honest with herself. And in so doing, a much larger picture came into focus. At that moment, she realized that God was simply closing a door, one that she thought about walking through many times. The honesty disclosed to her that she no longer felt fully engaged with the position she held at this organization. She knew for a while that it was time to move on, but never drew up the courage to walk away from a good salary with benefits in a weakening economy. It was in this larger picture where she felt the Holy Spirit was pushing her out of her comfort zone and into an area of newfound that the decision was made for her, rather than by her, was simply part of the embarrassment she had to come to terms with. This corporate lady understood that there was no animosity behind the decision. Rather, there was much agonizing and regret to lay off so many people, herself included. As long as she was focused on what they did to me, she placed herself in the victim stance, where resentment felt justified. But the moment she lifted her eyes from upon herself and onto the work of the divine, she could see clearly behind the surface facts and no longer felt aggrieved, but relieved. And it was at that point of comfort where forgiveness scarcely <coughs> seemed relevant. Painful as it was to be torn away from a community of colleagues, and as anxiety-provoking as the loss of a steady income was, she could thank her boss for cutting the strings of organizational constraint 
and setting her loose to explore her calling afresh. While this story did have a happy ending, we know from experience that this is not always the case. Situations like these become harmful when we allow caustic emotions to creep in and focus us inwardly. Remember, last week I mentioned sin makes us focus on ourselves, while grace causes us to focus outwards onto Christ and neighbor. When we allow ourselves to be consumed by selfish desires, we can become bitter and we can become angry. We lose sight of the bigger picture that God has in store. Thompson raises some good questions that I think we can ponder on when circumstances like these happen to us. How do we see a situation when we step away from our egos? How broad or high is our perspective? And what might God's perception be? What new possibilities lie within the pain of the moment? What new life sleeps inside this form of death, waiting to be awakened? These are very good questions, and our capacity to explore such questions will depend in part on the nature of the offense, the depth of the wound experienced, and the level of our own emotional and spiritual maturity. <clears throat> if we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we allow divine wisdom to lead us. Remember, remember what James tells us. The wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. God's wisdom brings us to the level of emotional and spiritual maturity that Thompson says is necessary for honest self-examination. Now that is a story when we might not want to forgive because of selfish reasons. There are times in our lives when we can't yet forgive. This isn't just holding a grudge because we felt entitled to something. This is the type of loss that reaches deep into the soul or actively influences others. If, shall we say, in the story of the corporate lady, the loss of her job created a serious financial crisis for her family, she might well have needed more time to acknowledge and absorb the larger perspective. In that case, the loss didn't impact at just a personal or selfish level. It impacted a wider group of people, her family. Thompson affirms that saying, I can't yet, is perfectly honest and reasonable response. and may even be the healthiest response under some circumstances. She continues, serious offenses against the humanity of a person involving physical or psychological trauma cannot be forgiven quickly. When we are deeply wounded by betrayal or violence, it will take time, perhaps a long time, before sufficient inner healing prepares the soil of our hearts to nurture the fruit of forgiveness. I'm sure you can think of a time in your own life or in the life of another where this forgiveness was hard to muster. Now imagine if you have hurt someone that deeply, you can see why they may have yet to forgive you. I'll share a personal story. When I got married, I invited three of my closest friends to be my groomsmen. Two I had known since primary school, and one I befriended while at college. One of them I had known since sixth grade. He and I have experienced and experimented with so much throughout our grade school years. And I mean everything from the video games and the outdoor play to the various things that high school boys get into. I came here to Virginia to go to college while he stayed in Alabama to attend one of the state universities. We texted back and forth and throughout the school year, and every winter and summer I would return home and we spent countless hours in tomfoolery. By the time I went off to seminary, however, we had been separated enough that we had two distinct friend groups, as opposed to the high school circles we shared immediately after graduation. Nevertheless, I was determined to have the one friend I shared the most experience with come and participate in the day that was so special to me. So we talked and prepared, and I told him all the details of the wedding. 
Well, come two days before the wedding and we're all gathered in Denver, save for him. At first, we thought maybe he was running late. But as the day drew to a close, he did not appear. I called his cell phone four times, twice it rang, and twice it went straight to voicemail, which means he was hanging up on me. I had to call his father to find out that he never even left Alabama. Moreover, his father had no idea that I was even engaged. Eventually, I, through other avenues, I discovered that uh, he apparently couldn't get that weekend off from work. Now, this example is by no means a tragedy. No one had their identity stolen. No one died. <laughs> but nonetheless, I felt betrayed by one of my oldest and closest friends. I would have been extremely reasonable if he had told me he couldn't get that weekend off, especially with enough advance notice. I most certainly would have missed having him at the ceremony, but I would have understood. Instead, I felt like our friendship, no, our brotherhood, was nothing to him. The betrayal was compounded since he didn't even share my engagement with his family, whom I consider an extended family of my own. Even to this day, I still haven't talked to him. I've sent him a letter, but I don't know if I can forgive him just yet. I'm sure I will eventually, but for now the wound is still too deep, too fresh. He hasn't even said he was sorry. So part of this sermon series is for my benefit, and I hope that uh, I am not holding a selfish grudge or grasping onto emotions of entitlement. I think that's where the self-examination will help me most. But I do have a hope that he and I will be reconciled one day. So allow me to close with one final word. Forgiveness is so much a part of who we are as Christians. It is in our theological framework, and it runs in our ancestral DNA. We are called to offer forgiveness when someone comes to us in repentance. We shouldn't seek to hold a grudge or use a person's contrition against them. Remember Jesus' parable. God has already forgiven us of a debt so unimaginable. Let us not hold on to the relatively insignificant offenses of others and open our hearts to forgiveness. And in some cases, it is healthier for time to say, I can't forgive you right now. But we should never let that be the final word. We should, even in the most painful of circumstances, and in due time, open ourselves to God's calling of forgiveness. Next week, we'll close this series with the final result of reconciliation. For now, let us pray. Holy God, your willing grace astonishes us when we consider what we as human beings have done to each other, to your creatures, and to this beautiful earth. Each of us has the seeds of destructiveness within us, yet we struggle with hard feelings when it comes our turn to forgive others. Soften the soil in our hearts with the spring rain of your grace. Prepare us to be merciful as you are merciful. We ask this in the name of Christ, your mercy poured out upon us.
without the breath of God, we are dry bones. And without the word of God, we are dust. With gratitude, let us offer our lives and all we have to the Lord of God.
God, our provider, out of your fullness you cause life to spring up in barren landscapes. You have power to, to control troubled waters, making a path of safety. You hear our cries and receive our tears. You restore us to joy and laughter. <coughs> you have done great things for us, O God, and care deeply for your creation. We thank you, O God. You are making all things new. With thanksgiving, we celebrate your care and the gift of newness in our lives, for recovery from illness or in injury, for calm after a time of unrest or turmoil, for a sense of direction after uncertainty, for new life, for new opportunities. We thank you, O oh God, you are making all things new. We pray for people who wait in difficult places, for those who are suffering and those at life's end, for people struggling with employment and financial worries, for those estranged from loved ones, for those trapped in the grip of addiction, for people enduring emotional or spiritual turmoil. Because you are able to make a way in every wilderness, we thank you, O oh God. You are making all things new. And we pray for the church, the body of Christ in the world, that we may boldly and ceaselessly proclaim your word. Lead us by the power of your spirit to witness to your truth. For we remember and proclaim that death does not have the last word in our lives, in the church, or in the world. We thank you, O oh God. You are making all things new. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. And now, my friends, I invite you to stand and sing hymn number 379, My Hope is Built on <coughs>
who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest in your souls. Friends, this is the Lord's table. Open to all repentant sinners who proclaim Jesus as their Savior. The Apostle Paul urges us to examine ourselves. For all who eat and drink without discernment, eat and drink judgment against themselves. Therefore, I invite all of us to prepare our hearts before the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with our whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then the fullness of time of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us, and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets and apostles and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name God of majesty and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to those with ears to hear. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remember your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, O Lord. We take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and a holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. According to Christ's commandment, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray, O oh God, that you will fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory. And we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Christ Jesus instructed us that when we pray, we do so as he taught us. Therefore, we boldly pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Jesus on the night of his arrest, he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again in glory. Now Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Friends, this is the feast of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Come and partake.
Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Help us who have shared Christ's body and received his cup to be his faithful disciples so that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom and our love be your love reaching out into the life of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. And now I invite you to stand and sing our final hymn, number 281, <laughs> Thy Me, O Thou Great Joe.